thanks for joining us for another edition of Mid American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain. And as always, joining me are three panelists who are here to answer your questions, show you some of their show and tells, and tell you a little bit more about where you can find them in the garden. So we'll have them introduce themselves. Uh, Ella, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Ella Maxwell. I live in Tazewell County. I'm a Tazewell County master gardener and a horticulturist at a local nursery. I really like trees and shrubs, and those are the kinds of questions I'm going to answer today. Wonderful. Thank you very much. All right, John. I'm John Bowden Center. I'm a Vermilion County master gardener. I live up by Bismarck, and I like uh, pastas, shade plants, and just about just about anything I like. I have a sampling of almost everything. Ooh, fun. And we're going to see one of those a little bit later in the show, right? All right. And right. Jen. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson. You can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. I'm a horticulturalist that likes just about anything plant related, but my favorite things are vegetable gardening and house plants. Um, a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. A generalist, I think, is what you normally yeah. call yourself, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So as usual, uh, we're going to start with show and tells. And um, Ella, we're going to start with you. This one might give you the creeps at home, um, but we've been talking about this um, in the last couple of shows. So you found something uh, kind of creepy outside. So um, this is a very real possibility that it could be something we've been talking about. So share with us what you found and kind of what the status is. Okay, um, I am um, concerned about jumping worms and I live in Tazewell County and right now uh, we don't have any confirmed cases, but counties surrounding us do and um, we are now uh, trying to get the message out that jumping worms can uh, be a problem in the home landscape. And so today I was weeding this morning and I came across in the upper surface right under some turf next to my flower garden about um, 10 little small worms and they were thrashing. And I thought my heart just dropped. And so I grabbed them all up and I carried them and got a Ziploc bag because if you do find jumping worms, uh, you can just put them in a Ziploc bag and leave them in the sun and the ultraviolet light will kill them. Uh, jumping worms do not overwinter as adults and they start out in early spring. There's a cocoon with these little um, like egg cells. Uh, jumping worms don't have to mate um, and they I've, I've had some conflicting information, but they could, uh, they are sexually mature or could in 60 days. So it's, it's really quick and they grow voraciously and they can get big. So anyway, I have these little inch and a half worms um, that I put in a plastic bag and we're going to look and let's see if I can make them well, they flopped before. They, they're maybe they're kind of. Oh yeah, there we go. Ooh. Oh boy, and that is literally the behavior that we were told to look out for. Right. Not right. the sort of normal moving, the thrashing. So that's was that your first clue? Um, was there the white band? Tell us well, everything. Well, again, <laughs> with the with the worms, they have what's called the satellum, and it's part of the reproductive part for all earthworms, and it's on the 14th segment. That's what makes it different than some other worms. But I heard or I read that there's like 25 hundred different species of worms and no worms are supposedly native to North America or at least to our part because of the glaciation, I believe. I'm not sure. But anyway, these jumping worms now have been confirmed in 14 or 15 counties in Illinois and in some other states as well, or maybe it's 14 or 15 other states. Anyway, I've got this picture and I am um, I sent it off to the extension, uh, to one of the extension specialists. And, and I don't know if I'm going to look at them closer after they die or whatever, but I, I'm just heart sick. So do so, be on the lookout. And it really is that little 
wiggling that, um, but then I was reading about red wigglers and I, I, I don't, I those don't are know. So much, those are so much smaller that I don't see where you would confuse those with an earthworm that the jumping oh, okay. earthworm. Are. Well, I'm not a fishing girl, so I don't know anything about, uh, we and I don't we do permaculture where you raise worms to eat your landscape or your um, home, um, you know, uh, waste, food, vegetable waste. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, jumping worms are out there, be on the lookout. And uh, the best thing to do is just scoop them up and put them in a bag and throw them away. And get them to your nearest extension office so you can get confirmation. Um, so right. if, if it is, Ella, is there anything that you need to do um, in that spot, it, what what will be the next steps well, if they are? Um, also, someone said that jumping worms can be irritated by um, powdered mustard mixed with some water and that regular earthworms are not. So the next thing I'm going to try is putting, dunking them in some mustard water. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, I, I am going to continue to do some research about them and, and, and find out. And again, I hope that it isn't the case. And, and, and I don't believe, unfortunately, that this would be an isolated incident in my yard. Um, no. So I guess it's something that, um, you know, it, the invasive qualities of them and they can only move about 40 yards. So the way that they moved into my garden is that I brought in a plant that must have had them on it. Okay. We and will definitely come from anywhere. We we'll tested. definitely follow that and see, uh, check back in with you next time you're on the show to find out how things are going with that. John, go ahead. Sorry. At our, at our plant sale, we tested every plant anybody brought in with the yellow mustard water mix you pour it you know and and it wouldn't be it'd be a good idea for any homeowner now they do not like the um soilless mix but if somebody digs something up in your in their yard and brings it to you get a little bit of white um or the yellow mustard powder mix it with water and just pour it up immediately jump out and we tested every plant at our plant sale uh in vermain county for that and we found none so that was the good news Okay, we'll have to. We'll it, definitely it took a lot of extra that. work, but fingers crossed for Ella's yard. Yeah. Okay, John, we're going to go to you for a show okay. and tell item. These are these are some of my favorite flowers. Um, this is circle flower. It's a Lismachia, and or yellow lustra, uh, and they the, the, you can see one of them is ver is variegated. This one here has got very nice variegated leaves and it doesn't get as many flowers, but just for the very, very uh, variegation of the leaves, it is really, really nice. And then the other one, it, it'll bloom like this for a month and a half. Wow. That is beautiful. That variegation with the colors. Now, how did you say, I, I may have missed it. How and tall? It's a perennial. How tall is uh, It'll that get to about um, 24 to 30 inches tall. And it is a perennial. It will spread out. Uh, I have heard some people have trouble with it getting very aggressive, but I have had it in my yard for, I got it from one of our other master gardeners about 10 years ago, and it has grown. It's probably tripled in size, but it's still, um, you know, I suppose a, a circle like this, mm -hmm. which really is nice. And, and I'm about ready to, to share with, it's to the point where I haven't been willing to share because um, but it's getting to that point where I will be able to share, uh, this coming spring when I, when we have our plant sale. Fantastic. Put me on the list. <laughs> okay. It is very, right. very nice. It is pretty. It looks gorgeous. Okay. Jen, where do you now? Well, I've brought an accidental show and tell. Um, this is some mint that I had cut from my garden to use for a sauce I was making. And, um, I stuck it in a glass of water when I was done because I thought, well, I might have something else to use it for because I didn't want to throw a perfectly good plant piece away, right? So 
I've been, we've been putting it in our water. We've been grabbing pieces for this and that. But then I looked the other day, I went to change the water and there are roots growing at the ends of the cuttings. And I thought, well, that's really great. If you wanted to propagate mint, most people <laughs> are trying to tear mint out of their garden, but it's a good um, demonstration of why mint is so difficult to control in the garden. Cause if those stems are growing along the ground and they just touch the uh, moist soil, they're going to start to root wherever they're touching and wherever the moisture is right. So even on my kitchen counter where it's not in front of a window or anything, it's, it's fight. It's will to live is strong. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thank you. And who doesn't like a little mint in their water, especially this time of year. So might not be right. a bad idea. My daughter says it's fancy. Yeah. It is fancy. Yes, Margaret. I agree yeah. with you. Very fancy. Yeah, she says, can I have fancy water like you, mommy? So sure, <laughs> yeah. we got plenty of mint. It doesn't stop growing. Yes, ever. we can do fancy water all summer long. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Ella, we are going to you. It is from Tony. It says, hi, I recently purchased several hydrangeas, the Endless Summer Original Variety, to use as a hedge in a partially sunny area. Purchased them both for their height and width as well as their abundant flowers. Now I'm being told that others in my zone, which is 5A, don't have luck with this variety. They say they tend to stay small and rarely flower. Do you have any experience with this plant or suggestions as to how I can make it perform better in my zone? I'm afraid that that I just wasted hundreds of dollars on a plant I'm going to end up removing in a couple of years. So um, Ella, what are your thoughts here? Um, unfortunately, Tony, I believe that uh, it was not a good purchase there. Um, if you do want to um, <clears throat> assure yourself of some flowers, you're going to have to mulch the plants in the fall once they've dropped their leaves. And this would be with uh, um, some loose shredded bark mounted up around the plant. Um, the Macrophylla hydrangea or the large leaf hydrangea here um, is a, a wonderful plant and they did develop it to have some reblooming characteristics, but the first blooms that you see come off of old wood. So you can tell that this is the old wood right here. And um, these would be the ones that would flower first now in June. And the endless summer was the very first um, one released commercially, but there have been many improvements. And for my personal experience, I found Bloomstruck as being one that has um, hardier buds and has a better reblooming characteristic. So if they are not mulched, what happens is the buds that come from the base of the plant will not have a terminal flower bud in June, which you would be seeing right now. So Tony, you need to check your plants to find out um, how many flowers you really have, because you'll see them. Uh, these will have side shoots later in um, September that will flower, but it's a long time to wait for flowers. And uh, I do have a friend who calls them endless bummers. And I think I've said that before. <laughs> um, so what you can do is a high phosphorus fertilizer does encourage bloom. The blooms can um, have a color change dependent on the aluminum uh, in the soil. So you can use uh, aluminum sulfate to keep them blue. Uh, in more alkaline soils, they'll bloom pink. Uh, there's a whole lot of different reblooming hydrangeas out there. Um, they do require some part shade because these large leaves will scorch easily. And I think we're going to see some pictures of that later in the show, maybe, or on the next show. But um, uh, fertilizing, protecting them from the winter, that's the best thing. But I think you'll find that you might want to switch to a different plant. All right, Jen and John, you were both nodding. Anything else you would want to add there? Um, I would add that we, uh, for hedge purposes, we're using uh, hydrangea paniculata, so a panicled hydrangea. 
and they get a lot bigger and they don't have this problem of only blooming or blooming better or earlier on old wood. I have some endless summers too and they look great where they're at, but we've got some that in spots that we want them to be a little bigger, a little more of a focal point. And so the panicled hydrangea is already setting flowers out right now. So we've had really good luck with that. And also with oak leaf hydrangea. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've got oak leaf hydrangea and in it's, the one I have is right at six foot and it's getting the nice pentacles on it right now. The, 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 the one that Ella has is, is always probably here going to die back to the, to the ground. And you're going to get very, very few side shoots. Uh, we had a mild, technically a mild winter last year. And uh, it, you know, they, they would be nice if, if we were in zone six or zone seven, but here it's, you're right on the edge and it's probably I, never going to be the big hedge that you want. I have seen them do well in uh, in certain locations. I, uh, I go to a bank that has them on the north side of their building, and they are flowering now. Um, I have seen them. I, I we went to St. Louis, and I took pictures of them at the. Um, uh, the St. Louis Botanical Garden, and they were doing quite well. So there's a lot out there. When you see them in the stores at this time of year, they have been forced, and uh, that flowering potential is not really realized, especially in Zone 5A. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. John, we're back around to you for another okay. show and um, I'm going to do the toothache plant now. Okay. This is a, a new plant that I got from Baker's Creeks. They have unusual plants and this flower. They used to have one that was half brown and half yellow. This one, as you can see, is all yellow and is much more showy. And this is just starting. This is just, I, I haven't even put it in the ground yet. And it, it will get to be about, oh, two feet tall and about two feet wide eventually. And uh, it's a, a native of Brazil. But if you chew on the flower, it um, it will numb your, if you have a toothache, if you chew on it and, 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 and put that right next to your uh, toothache, uh, it'll numb it. Um, is that, and tell me the name of it again. Is it the toothache plant? Tooth plant, and it is uh, Spilo, Spiloanthus acamella. Interesting. And native to Brazil, you said. Native to Brazil, but. Very cool. Um, We've um, grown it out at the VA for a number of years, but that was the brown and yellow one. Uh, now you can see that they've they've got a new cultivar and it's all yellow. And uh, so it's gonna be much showier and uh, does very well here. Uh, it will reseed itself and uh, it is a tender. It, it is not, it's an annual, but it will reseed itself. Uh, it's not hardy here and uh, which would stand for reason being it's from uh, Brazil, but mm -hmm. just a, you know, very nice. And it's also good for if you have dermatitis or a mosquito bite, if you take and, 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 uh, and, and mulch this, this um, flower up and then smear it on kind of on where the uh, mosquito bite is, um, it'll numb that too, might, might not to take the inflammation out. Perfect advice for this time of year. All right. Thanks, John. Jen, we're back to you for another show and tell. Well, I'm going to show my sister went to Hawaii in March and she brought me back this plant. It's just a cutting, but I'll show the card that came with it. Um, it's called a plumeria. That's what they make lays out of. And this came to me, it looked like a big stalk of asparagus in a plastic bag. And uh, other people watching may want to grow one at home. It's super easy. All I did was put it in uh, its cactus soil. And I did try to help it along by putting some rooting uh, gel along the sides of it. Uh, it took about a month before it started showing signs of life. And uh, so now we'll hopefully maybe get some flowers this year. If not this year, probably next year. I've grown them before and I, I was trying to remember earlier what killed, killed off my plants that I had before, probably just plain old neglect knowing myself, but uh, they're not hardy here at all. They're totally a tropical plant. So you do have to remember to bring them in 
and they do go dormant over the winter. So all these leaves will fall off and they'll just look like a bare stalk of asparagus in a pot. And people will wonder if you've lost all your marbles <laughs> at this point and what, what you're doing. But um, they're a fun plant. If you have some bigger space like a sunroom, they can get quite large. Mm -hmm. uh, it, that can be really uh, fun to have inside. And they smell really amazing. And that's why most people grow them. They do have an amazing smell. If you mm -hmm. keep it indoors, will it still go dormant yeah. or in the winter? Um, it will. I found that it will just because even our indoor temperatures in the winter are not warm enough for it. It really loves the summer and uh, it has always lost its leaves for me inside. Now I don't keep it. I don't keep my inside temperature super warm in the summer or in the winter. I mean, it's I'm not one that cranks the thermostat up, but even so it's, it does need that, that dormant period or in order to uh, set flowers the following year. We had one at the VA greenhouse for many years and it was about six, seven feet tall and it would go dormant in the wintertime. <clears throat> the nice thing was it would split and put out shoots. And if somebody wanted one, you could just, like a corn plant, you just cut off a piece and and let it callous over and then like jan did plant it and or, or put it in water and it'll root and you've got a whole new one so easy to wherever, it, wherever it flowers it will start to branch from that point gotcha cool all right thank you for sharing okay now we've got some questions uh that viewers have sent in ella we're going to go to you um and john for this one this is question number 50 um bear with it's another long one uh how do we know when it's time to give up on our autumn purple ash trees we are in a rural area between seymour and muhammad and persevered our 20 i'm sorry preserved our 20 plus year old ash trees with bare topical treatment so far we noticed the top canopy thinning somewhat last year there are spots where it's bare this year but the tree is filled out very nicely overall is there any way you can tell how it's doing without seeing the tree in person or looking at a picture and is there a tree doctor or a surgeon that you can recommend to help give us advice so they are really desperate to save this tree um, and john and ella uh, are going to tackle this question together so guys what do you think Okay, well, the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is the emerald ash borer has been in the state for I think now almost 20 years, and it is moving. And um, unfortunately, it can be fatal if the tree has not been treated. So to protect the tree, it does have to be treated yearly as a homeowner product. Uh, there are uh, tree care companies, certified arborists, that can inject um, a different type of chemical that can last for maybe two seasons, but this is going to require ongoing treatment, and as the tree becomes larger, the dosage has to increase in wells as well. So there comes a point where you have to make a hard decision on whether or not you want to continue this because untreated, the tree will probably succumb. And the tree has probably been fending off attacks for the last number of years. That's why they've seen some of this thinning and some dieback. It flushes back out again. It makes plenty of leaves to store carbohydrates to continue this growth. But as the tree declines, an untreated tree dies from the top down and you get all this uh, epicormic or these shoots coming out of the trunk of the tree, kind of the last ditch effort for it to um, manufacture food. Um, I do have a couple ash on my property, which I am at this point trying to remove over a period of time because it can be expensive to take down trees. Um, and it is not a good idea to leave them standing because um, uh, you, you don't want to have any storm damage or branches fall out. Um, so again, if you can't do the work yourself, you do have to pay someone to do it. So you can continue to treat trees and high valuable tree or high value trees in the right location. I know of a number of uh, businesses, communities, homeowners that are doing treatments, but it's a, a lifelong obligation and I am not committed to that. Okay, fair enough. John, what did you want to add? Yeah, I, I think Urbana has a, a arborist 
Uh, and he, I think he was even one of our panelists for a while. I think he's mm-hmm. retired. So just give the city a call, uh, Urbana, and see if, if they do have an arborist. Um, I have about seven or eight um, ash trees, and I had treated them and treated them and treated them. I, I had a losing battle, and I gave up, and I have now four left to cut down. And uh, this was the first year that I got no growth, nothing, you know, each year, like Ella was saying, you get these few branches coming off that green up. And after that, uh, this year, I have had nothing. I've got to hire someone to cut because they're very large trees. And it's a shame. But um, even with uh, the um, professional, it's a it, it can be a losing battle. And it, you know, if, if they said 20 years from the time that it's infected in your area before the ash borers get to the point where there's not enough uh, ash trees for them to survive and then they'll succumb, then they'll die out and your ash tree will be the only ash tree within miles, then you may be able to keep it. But as long as there's an ash borer in the area, you have to keep treating that ash tree. So, uh, you know, like Ella said, as they get bigger, you have to add more and more and more chemical each year. Wow. And like she said, also, it's a it's an obligation that you have to keep up with. So, well, guys, thank you. Uh, Our time is up. That always goes so fast. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your time and talents. And thank you so much for watching. If you have a question for our panelists, please send it in. You can email us at yourgarden at gmail.com or you can find us on Instagram and Facebook. Just search Mid-American Gardener. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Good night.